for The Life of the World is produced by the Yale Center for Faith and Culture. For more information, visit faith.yale.edu. If I am gripped by fear, when I hear someone telling me not to fear, I'm likely to feel even more inadequate and fearful than I already am. I will feel diminished, and that will do exact opposite from giving me strength to overcome fear. That's why in the Bible, the injunction not to fear is tied to the assurance that we are cared for. Ultimately, assurance that God cares for us. And they're tied also, second, to promises that though we may suffer, we will ultimately emerge as conquerors. This is For the Life of the World, a podcast about seeking and living a life worthy of our humanity. Dear friends, this episode of the podcast is coming out on Easter Saturday, at the time when Jesus was suspended between his suffering on Good Friday uh, and his resurrection on Sunday. And I know that many of us are experiencing what to us seemed like our own little Good Fridays. And I hope that for all of us, Easter will be a celebration of joy that conquers all of our fears. Thanks for joining us today. I'm Evan Rosa with the Yale Center for Faith and Culture. That, of course, was Miroslav Wolf, who will be sharing today his thoughts on conquering fear. What does it mean to fear rightly? What should we make of the New Testament's injunctions to fear not? And how does our perspective on fear change when we look at it through the lens of Jesus' own agony and fear in the Garden of Gethsemane, replete with lonely isolation from his sleeping friends and his plea that God remove this cup from me? Many of us now are feeling the same isolation, the loneliness, and we collectively work and pray to have this pandemic removed from us. In this episode, following Miroslav's comments, Ryan McAnally Linz and Drew Collins ask a few questions about Miroslav's ideas here. So listen on and make sure you catch the conversation at the end about the fear of suffering in scripture and pandemic context. A reflection on Matthias Grunewald's Isenheim altarpiece, which was originally intended to comfort sufferers of the Black Plague. And the question of the meaning of prayer in the context of fear. It's been two weeks since the launch of the show in the midst of so much chaos, and we want to take a moment to thank each of you for listening. The show has already grown, and many of you have shared and responded and left ratings and reviews. Thank you. If you haven't subscribed yet, take a second and click or tap that little subscribe button in your favorite podcast app. That way you don't miss future episodes, and trust me, we've got some amazing stuff coming your way. In fact, one we just recorded, a 45-minute discussion between Miroslav and his colleague Willie Jennings on the racial and economic disparities that are surfacing during this pandemic and, and really have been there all along. Thinking about how the crowd mentality of human tribes runs on fear instead of faith, uh, it was just so good. Excited to bring it to you. So subscribe and keep an eye out. And for now, I'll pass it over to Miroslav. Enjoy. When a pandemic like COVID-19 breaks out, the social pandemic of fear is not far behind. Now, that's partly because uh, when we see other people fearing, we catch the malady of fear ourselves. But I think it's also partly because the cultural fear has weakened our immunity to fear. Now, to say that there is a pandemic of fear means at one level simply that there are a lot of people who are afraid. Some of us are paralyzed by fear, drawn into ourselves like a shell. Others of us are thrust into hyperactive mode. Some of us reach for comforts of food, of alcohol, of drugs to find relief from worry and anxiety. Others buy guns and stock up ammunition, fearing that pandemic will cause collapse of social order or, God forbid, totalitarian government to seize power and to take away our liberties. Now, the task before us, I've argued in my previous podcast, is a twofold. First, the danger of COVID-19 is real, and we must work assiduously to diminish it. This is not acting in fear. It is, in fact, acting out of love and concern for the common good. 
But second, and that's what I said also in my previous episode, we need to fight against our own fear and against the culture of fear. We cannot eliminate all dangers from the world, and it takes time to eliminate those dangers we can eliminate. And so, as a consequence, I think we always have to live with dangers, both real dangers and also imagined ones too. So we need to cultivate the ability to live with fear, to master it rather than letting it engulf us, not to let fear colonize our imagination and rule our practices. For this podcast, I reflect on what the Christian faith has to say about how to master fear, or perhaps more precisely, about how to fear rightly, as Kierkegaard urged, as I mentioned in the previous podcast. Now, if you look at the Bible, fear not is one of the most frequently repeated injunctions. And we often hear it actually from the lips of Jesus himself. Fear not. Now, let's be clear what this injunction does not mean. It is not a call to disregard or minimize potential danger. One of the greatest Christian thinkers of all time, Thomas Aquinas, noted that disregarding or minimizing danger is a sign of either pride or of stupidity and likely of both. And it is often caused by suppressed fear and by the inability to face danger. Not to fear means to see danger clearly and yet not to be overwhelmed by its prospect. The Apostle Paul puts this stance succinctly and very powerfully in an autobiographical statement. He writes in 2 Corinthians, We are afflicted in every way but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair. Or you can approach this whole issue from the perspective of famous definition of fear which Aristotle gave. And he said in rhetoric that fear is a pain or disturbance due to a mental picture of some destructive or painful evil in the future. Now, if this indeed is nature of fear, then to conquer fear is not to let ourselves be mastered by pain or disturbance over possible future suffering. Let's agree that fear not injunction isn't asking us to demonstrate the courage of an ostrich when faced with danger. Still, we may wonder how useful it is to tell someone not to fear. Some of you will know from my book, The End of Memory, that in my 20s, while I was living in former Yugoslavia, I was interrogated repeatedly over a period of months by the military police, basically because I was a conscientious objector and because I had close ties to many people in the West. Had someone told me not to fear when I was being interrogated, I would have scoffed. And when someone threatens you, I might have responded, you just grow yourself a pair of wings and escape into freedom. If I am gripped by fear, when I hear someone telling me not to fear, I'm likely to feel even more inadequate and fearful than I already am. I will feel diminished, and that will do exact opposite from giving me strength to overcome fear. That's why in the Bible, the injunction not to fear is tied to the assurance that we are cared for. Ultimately, assurance that God cares for us. And they're tied also, second, to promises that though we may suffer, we will ultimately emerge as conquerors. And that's why in the New Testament, all injunctions not to fear except one come from the mouth of Jesus or angels, which is to say from those who are in fact capable of rescuing us from danger or imparting us strength to face it. 
One of the probably most famous sayings of Jesus, certainly one of the best knowns when it comes to fear, is the following one. Do not be afraid, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. According to the Gospel of Luke, Jesus said these words to his disciples, then a small, marginal, persecuted group. He gave them the reason not to fear by giving them a promise. As they face danger, what awaits them at the end is not simply loss of what they have and what they cherish, though that may happen as well. What awaits them is a lasting gift they could never acquire themselves, the peace and security of the kingdom of God. What was required of them was nothing like suppression or elimination of fear. What was required instead was fear of God and trust in God. Now, let's just take this question of trust, trust in God. Just as we don't stop fearing when we are told not to fear, we don't just trust because we are told to trust. Instead, we trust those who are trustworthy or we trust those who we think are trustworthy. And then you might ask, well, but what kind of persons are trustworthy? And the response is, I think, threefold. They need to be competent with regard to things with which we trust them. They need to be well disposed toward us, or at least not ill disposed toward us. And they need to be likely not to change or lose either their competency or their good disposition toward us. Accordingly, Jesus assures his disciples that they are objects of God's good pleasure, that God is well disposed toward them. And he also implies that God, being God, is able to give them the good God intends for them, and that God, being God again, does not change. Now, a quick read through the first part of Luke 12 shows that the call to combat fear with trust in God, it was an integral part of a set of Jesus' teaching. Those were teachings about persecution, teachings about insecurity of wealth, about pointlessness of worry, and about worthy objects of our striving. Let's take each one of these teachings very briefly. First teaching about persecution. Persecuted disciples were faced with a stark and seemingly impossible alternative. Give up your faith, which is to say, give up what is most important in your life, or you will die. Jesus responds, Do not fear those who kill the body, and after that can do nothing more. In other words, What persecutors want to take away from you, the worship of the one true God in the fellowship of Jesus, is more important than life itself. He then goes on to say two things about how to overcome fear. The cure from the fear of people who endanger our lives, the cure also from the fear of things that endanger our lives as well, the cure is paradoxically a certain kind of fear. He says, But I will warn you whom to fear. Fear him who, after he has killed, has authority to cast into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. Now, This is a really startling statement, not because it speaks about fear of God, but because it describes God as killing and casting humans into hell. But behind the talk of God casting into hell is the conviction that there is something worse than death. And what is worse than death is life as living death. Life that we continue to live, but life which is drained of its humanity. 
Keep in mind that notwithstanding the talk of God's killing and casting into hell, the fear of God is not trembling before an overwhelming power of the one who wants to harm us. It is reverence before the one who is the source of true life. Fearing God is therefore beginning of wisdom, the key to true life. A few decades after Jesus' death and resurrection, the Apostle Peter wrote to persecuted followers of Christ and offered what we may consider as something like a commentary to this statement of Jesus. He writes, But even if you suffer for doing what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear what they fear, and do not be intimidated, but in your heart sanctify Christ as Lord. Now, you may ask, what do persecutors fear, and what do they expect their victims to fear, and what therefore disciples shouldn't fear? They fear suffering and loss of life, and they expect their victims to fear the same. Peter encouraged his persecuted fellow Christians not to fear what persecutors expect them to fear, but to sanctify Christ as the Lord. To sanctify Christ, to hold Christ as Lord holy, is in fact to fear God. It is to revere God more than anything else. It is to make the striving to reflect God's goodness in the world the supreme goal of our lives. Now, let's return back to Jesus and his instruction. The first cure against fear of human beings was fear of God. That's what I just explained. But the second cure is there too. Second cure against fear of persecutors is trust in the God who cares for disciples, but who cares also for their physical well-being. Are not five sparrows sold for two pennies? And yet not one of them is forgotten in God's sight. But even the hairs of your head are all numbered. Do not be afraid. So that's the teaching of Jesus about persecution. There's also teaching about insecurity of wealth in that same context. Now, Jesus tells them the very famous parable of the rich fool. Its point is that a person can have more than what they need to secure their livelihood and still fail to enjoy it because death can come unexpectedly and steal away both life and livelihood. Then there is teaching about pointlessness of anxious worry. Ravens, Jesus says, smart birds, but only birds nonetheless. Ravens are fed by God without needing to worry. Lilies, mere flowers, do not need to worry, and yet they are clad by God more impressively than the great King Solomon ever was. God knows Jesus' disciples' ordinary physical needs, and meeting those needs is included in the gift of the kingdom that God promises. Hence, the big worry, the big striving of the disciples should be after the very thing that God, in God's good pleasure, has promised to give them. It's the striving after the kingdom of God. And that takes us to the final set of teachings, which is teachings on true treasure. What is the true treasure? It's not possessions. It's not even the existence itself. The true treasure is precisely that kingdom in which existence, possession, and a life abundant for everyone are included. Now, the main point of this fear not teaching is this. God, the master of the universe and the Lord of history, has promised to give the disciples of Jesus that most important treasure, which is the kingdom of God itself. That's why the disciples, the little flock, should not fear, no matter what. Fear of God and trust in God. Keep alive the hope for the kingdom of God, and that hope overcomes fear.
but fear of God and trust and hope in God that overcome fear, they can be severely tested. We can face what we know will be a great affliction, and then fear can come and overwhelm us. In the Gospels, the starkest example of the struggle to overcome fear and to trust God in extreme affliction is Jesus' agony in Gethsemane. We are all familiar with the story. Before he was apprehended and handed to the Romans to be crucified, Jesus took his disciples to the garden in the foothills of the Mount Olives. He knew that he would be apprehended, tortured, and killed. He knew that the hour of the powers of darkness was about to strike. He sought solace and courage in prayer. Jesus was clearly afraid. He was distressed and agitated, the gospel writers uh, say, deeply grieved, deeply grieved even unto death. And having thrown himself on the ground, he prayed to God, Abba, Father, for you all things are possible. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I want, but what you want. Needing support in this affliction, Jesus asked his disciples to remain close to him and to keep awake. But their eyes were very heavy, the gospel writers say, and they fell asleep, leaving him alone in his agony. They had no explanation to give. They did not know what to say when he asked him about why they had fallen asleep. But the evangelist Luke, a medical doctor, did know. He writes that they fell asleep because of the grief, because of sorrow mixed with fear. As you know from the story, three times Jesus prayed, and three times he found his disciples asleep, and three times he did not get the answer from God he wanted. Still, he finished his prayer transformed. After his third failed request to God to remove the cup of suffering and death on the cross from him, he came to the disciples and said, Get up, let us be going. Going where? Going into the darkness, into suffering, into death. Let us be going does not necessarily imply that all fear was gone. What it makes clear is that the power of fear had been broken. After the prayer, Jesus emerged victorious from the experience of being engulfed by fear, indeed of the experience of almost having been lost to fear. But still, he had to go through extreme suffering. He still had to listen to the mocking of his enemies, deriding what seemed to be his misplaced trust in God. He still had to experience God's silence and feel that God has abandoned him. He still had to die. But his victory over fear in Gethsemane was a little resurrection before the crucifixion. It made him able to walk into suffering and death with the dignity of the one who was afflicted in every way but not crushed, perplexed but not driven to despair. This victory over fear of suffering and victory over fear of death anticipated the victory over suffering and death themselves that came on Easter morning when Christ was raised into God's glory. In his reflection on the anxiety of Christ, Jürgen Moltmann, ah, who, by the way, is today, as I read this, celebrating his 94th birthday. In his reflection on Christ's anxiety, Moltmann wrote, We are released from our fear through Christ's fear. We are freed from our suffering through Christ's suffering. Paradoxically, these wounds of ours are healed through other wounds 
as Isaiah 53 promises of the servant of God. It is a deep theological and spiritual insight that Christ's fear releases us from our fear. This has been a comforting experience of many suffering Christians throughout the two millennia of Christian history. But we need to say more than Maltman did. We need to say also that Christ's fear can release us from fear because he, in fact, conquered fear. We too can conquer the power of fear as Jesus conquered the power of fear. We too can conquer the power of death as Jesus conquered the power of death. How then can we conquer fear and fear of death? We can conquer fear by entrusting our lives to the God who promises to give us the kingdom. And we can conquer the fear of death through hope that we will be raised into glory by the power of the same Spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. So Miroslav, it struck me that there may be an important disanalogy between the situation that the biblical texts you were focusing on address and our current situation. And I'm, I'm wondering if you could kind of think through this with me a little bit. Um, so a number of the texts you were talking about focused on the possibility of persecution. And it seems like in that case, the threat is directly linked to what it is you hold to be most important. Uh, persecution is the, the attempt to make you give up something that you hold to be of great value uh, by way of, of fear, physical, physical or other threat. Um, in the case of this pandemic, um, it's not quite like that. Uh, the virus doesn't care if you hold to your faith or not. There's no extortion going on here. Um, it seems arbitrary, kind of random. Uh, and I'm wondering if that changes the shape of the fear involved. And if so, does it change the shape of the kind of resources that we need in order to overcome fear? Mm, yeah, that's, that's very interesting and very important question. Um, I think what you observe, uh, uh, I think can be observed more generally for the New Testament as a whole. Um, also, when it comes to uh, not just fear, but suffering, uh, actually experience suffering, not just anticipating the suffering, um, <clears throat> that um, bulk of um, attention uh, is, ma is given to suffering on account of being a follower of Christ, which I think is understandable given that uh, Christians were early on uh, a persecuted uh, minority. And there are important uh, d disanalogies. Uh, I'm not sure whether I'm uh, fully ready to uh, unpack all the disanalogies and um, analogies as well. But what it seems to me that um, uh, is connects them is that there's a certain kind of uh, assault in one case, very personal, in the other case, a kind of impersonal assault resulting in great deal of potentially great deal of suffering resulting in uh, in death and uh, persecution and more kind of quote unquote natural uh, sources of, of suffering uh, are united in this. And I think in terms of uh, how one how one responds, it's interesting to me that uh, especially Gethsemane scenes, but uh, um, uh, even more, the crucifixion scene has been consistently used uh, throughout church history to attend to, or Christian history is has been used to attend to uh, just those kinds of natural uh, diseases that we are now uh, describing. And uh, I'm thinking of uh, a piece that you um, uh, may have seen or some of the listeners may have uh, seen in Colmar, France. Uh, that's, this is an uh, uh, altarpiece in Isenheim. And it was famous Matthias Grunewald uh, painting of, of Christ. Uh, Karl Barth used to be a, a big devotee of this and the role that um, 
uh, that John John the Baptist plays in, in, in the whole thing. But but kind of pointing to the Lamb of God, that's the entirety of the function of theology, entirety of the function of uh, of a minister. But uh, the piece was commissioned by uh, St. Anthony Monastery, and monks of St. Anthony were devoted to caring for uh, peasants and uh, kind of social pariahs, especially those who had skin diseases and also uh, those who suffered uh, from plague. And they involved also in production of very various medicinal uh, means to attend to, to to illness, but they were bringing always the sufferers before the uh, this this altar, and this there's this identification with uh, Jesus Christ, who is the God who they know will rise uh, uh, as well. And if you look at the, the backside of the piece, there is, in fact, this translucent Christ uh, ascending into, into glory. A uh, point that I'm uh, making is simply that this um, uh, kind of the, the similar ways in which I use the uh, Gethsemane um, and could be used also the crucifixion has been used in order to attend to diseases that are not of the t- uh, or the, the threats that are not of the type that persecution represents. Miroslav, as you as you point out, no matter how many different ways we talk about fear or recommend people um, understand fear, there's still that sort of basic question of okay, I am afraid. What should I do now? And I was really, you know, of course, you can't, we, it's, we can't talk about this as Christians without talking about Gethsemane, as you did. And, and you had this wonderful line where you described Jesus's night in Gethsemane as a victory over fear. And that really struck me in part because we know that Jesus prayed and we actually know the prayer that he prayed, but we don't know, we're not given, we're not given to, to we're not given God's response. There's a sort of, you know, for, we, we have no idea what Jesus heard in, 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 in response to anything, which makes me think that what was it about prayer that was the victory over fear? And, and can we say maybe that not just that we pray to conquer fear, but that prayer itself is a victory over fear? Mm-hmm. Um Yes, certainly. So the the prayer not just as an instrument, but uh, prayer uh, as a as a kind of a, a kind of an end uh, itself, and that's uh, because we're close to God in some ways. We are entrusting ourselves to God in in prayer. Um, yeah, the whole question of prayer is a is a very important, very interesting uh, question. I, I think for me. It's important not to interpret this victory over fear as an elimination of fear, that now Jesus was standing there, a completely fearless, uh, heroic uh, figure. I, I think this is a uh, willingness to face danger, notwithstanding the fear and to do what needs to be and needs to be done. And in terms of the content of prayer, I often think, uh, you know, in those kinds of situations, prayer takes a form that it takes. Uh, it's a cry of the heart. Uh, it's almost, it isn't so much words that pray. It's the heart that prays. It's the entire being that prays, that's reaching out to something uh, that would uh, kind of assure one that in the end things uh, are going to be uh, go, uh, going to be uh, okay, whatever uh, end result uh, being. And um, I, I think that's certainly one function of prayer. Which then reminds me that I think prayer, in a sense, is uh, is one element, but prayer depends on something prior to itself. It depends on kind of a nurture, uh, nurturing of trust, and in a sense, prayer is a modality of nurturing and enacting the trust uh, in God. And sometimes, in very difficult situations, it's precisely hard to master any trust and master ability uh, to pray. And I think that situations of danger uh, place before us, uh, have us reflect on what it might mean to nurture trust throughout our lives. Trust is nurture, nurtured as we go uh, along. I mean, Maltman just wrote about uh, Christian hope as being hope that in the end, there's always a beginning. In any possible end, there's always a new beginning. Uh, and th- th- that presupposes most, fun- more fun- most fundamental trust 
that that which happens to Christ when he dies and is raised, that happens uh, to all of us. This is who God is, and this is at the, at the foundation of reality. And somehow, if we can internalize that uh, in our daily lives, when the crisis comes, it'll be easier to conquer fear, not to suppress it, not to not be fearful, but to live as we ought to, fear notwithstanding. That's it for this episode. Happy Easter. And whatever your circumstances as you're listening to this, may you find cause for some joy. For the Life of the World is a production of the Yale Center for Faith and Culture at Yale Divinity School. This episode featured theologian Miroslav Wolf, founding director of the Yale Center for Faith and Culture. You can follow him on Twitter at Miroslav Wolf. Also appearing on this episode were Ryan mcinelli Linz and Drew Collins. I'm Evan Rosa, and I edit and produce the show. For more information, visit us online at faith.yale.edu and subscribe to the show wherever you listen to podcasts. If you're looking for a way to support us, that could be as simple as telling your closest friends, leaving a rating and review in Apple Podcasts, or sharing the show in your social feeds. Thank you for listening. We'll talk to you next week. Mm-hmm.